Hello and welcome to Valerie and Valise, the YouTube channel that is all about helping you travel in Alaska, getting all the advice you need to plan your ultimate bucket list Alaska trip, as well as to explore the rest of the American West. My name is Valerie, as the name would suggest, and I am very excited to be back for another one of my Alaska seminar series for 2023. And this, this year, this is a brand new destination that I get lots of questions about, but I am not as much of an expert as I would like to someday be. So I am very excited to be chatting with Carrie Whitmer, who is a National Park Service employee. She will give us her full title in just a second. And she works out in Wrangell St. Elias National Park. And the fun trivia about Wrangell St. Elias it is that it's the biggest national park in the country. And it's huge, like twice as big as Denali. So you think there's a lot to know about Denali and planning your trip there. There is so much to explore in Wrangell St. Elias, and I'm very excited to dive into this. So as usual, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments or the chat, whatever you can see on YouTube right now if you're watching this live. If you're watching the replay, you can comment down below, leaving your questions there, and I will do my best to answer them or get Carrie to chime in if we need to in the future. And without further ado, let's just get right into it. Thank you so much for joining me, Carrie. Very welcome, and thank you, Valerie, for the opportunity to talk about my home and this amazing park called Wrangell St. Elias. And my name is Carrie Whitmer, and I'm the team lead for interpretation and education here at Wrangell St. Elias. And that means I oversee all of the visitor centers and all the visitor services. So um, I am in a great place to be able to tell you what there is to do here. And um, Valerie, if you'll go to the to the first slide. I, I intentionally put in a winter slide because weather is a big deal in Alaska. Um, I, I give daily weather updates to my family. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a great point of conversation. So just wanted to give you the inside scoop of what it looks like right now. And this is what it looks like. This is a picture overlooking Mount Drum, one of our many peaks in the park. And over to the side of it is Mount Sanford and then off into the distance is, is Mount Wrangell, and that's one of the mountain ranges, just one of the four mountain ranges that we have in the park. And you can see this view from our main visitor center in Copper Center. So actually today is really mild. We are having temperatures in the 30s, which is crazy. It's too warm. Um, we, we like our temps kind of on the cold side, anywhere between minus 20 up to 10. And that's kind of the good skiing, cross-country skiing temps and keeps everything nice and snowy. When we get up towards the 30s, things start to melt and we don't like it very much. But I also wanted to mention winter because more there's more an increasing interest in coming to Alaska in the winter because it's incredible. There are gorgeous views like this. And um, I saw the Northern Lights last night. That's also a huge attraction. But I would say that for our park, if you're thinking of coming to Wrangell, winter is a more complex uh, and an adventurous time of year to visit. And we don't have very many services that are open. We don't have any services that are open in the winter. And um, our roads are really dangerous. So you really have to have the right transportation. It's also dark. Um, for a lot of the winter right now, we have daylight from about 9.30 until about 4. So the darkness during the middle of the winter makes it challenging to, to go and do things because it is both cold and dark. Um, however, um, Denali, which I know that Valerie also has a presentation to Denali. Denali does have visitor services in the winter. It's pretty limited, um, but they are more set up for winter visitation. And I just say that because I do get visitors calling and they're, they, I just drive in Anchorage. It's November. What can I do? And I have to kind of disappoint people and tell them you can come. The park's open. Um, like Valerie said, we're, we're the, the largest national parks in the, in the entire national park service units at 13.2 million acres. So there's always something to do. It's always open, but the the cold and dark can make it pretty challenging. So, but it's also what makes it an interesting place, of course. So a little bit more about myself. I have worked in six of the 424 National Park Service units. Um, I've had the great pleasure to work at some of the Park Service's crown jewels, including Crater Lake National Park, Grand Canyon National Park, Black Canyon of the Gunnison, if you know where that is, it's it's in um, the middle of Colorado. I've also worked at uh, an eastern park, uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, 
all amazing places. And total reveal, where do I go on my vacations? I'm like a lot of rangers where I go to national parks <laughs> for, for my own travel, my own travel destinations. Um, I can't help myself. They're incredible, inspiring places. And certainly Wrangell St. Elias is, is no exception. So another couple things about this place, and you can see by this photo also, like this photo is taken from, from the road and I'll give a little bit of an orientation on a map but you're looking kind of into the heart of the park. And then even beyond that, you're just looking at a vast landscape. We are six times uh, the size of Yellowstone National Park. So if you thought Yellowstone was big, or even bigger, it's a lot of wilderness. It's a lot of wild place. We don't have very many places where you can, can go in your car. I'll talk about the two that you can go to. It's, it's, an, it's a wilderness place, which is what makes it special. And it's also an inhabited wilderness. And, and with the National Park Service, this is kind of a, um, and, the, and the Wilderness Act, it's a little bit of a, a challenging concept because I think we, you know, I'm from the lower 48, originally from California. I think of wilderness as where it's untrammeled by man. And when this park was established in 1980 um, through a, a, an act of Congress, they really wanted to recognize that people have been in this place for literally thousands of years. And they have been on our glaciers. They have been on the sides of mountains. They have been in the rivers. Um, this place has been inhabited for a long time by our, our native partners, people who are still here using this place. Um, the Eyak, the Atna, the Upper Tanana, and the, the Yakutat Clinket tribes are all here. And they are still using this place, as well as some other of our local people who live in the surrounding area. So there is there is hunt. There's a lot of fishing in the Copper River, which kind of defines our border. Um, but there's also hunting and trapping and gathering, both in the park um, for our subsistence users, our locals, and our tribal partners, and then also in the in the part of the park that's preserved. But it, it's this it's this chance to kind of revision what wilderness means, that there, that there can be wild and spectacular and remote places, but also acknowledging that that there are very few places that don't have a history of, of people living in them. So I've said something about the size, I've talked about wilderness, I've talked about how remote it is. So if Valerie, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is our, this is part of our map. It doesn't include the southern part of, of the park. I just want to talk a little bit about like, you know, what is here to see? Like if you're, if you're coming to Wrangell St. Elias, why, why would you come here? And part of the lure is that size matters. Like we have, we have four mountain ranges in our park. We have nine of the 16 highest peaks in North America in our park. We have vast landscapes that, that are big enough that, that even though this is an inhabited wilderness, the presence of people has a reduced impact. And our wildlife, our our landscape level changes, things like erosion, things like glaciation, things like uplifting in mountains, they're, they're still happening here and they're very visible. So certainly you can come to see our mountain ranges and there's, you, in the middle of the, of the map, you can see the white and that's the Wrangell, yeah, thank you, Valerie, that's the Wrangell mountain range. Um, and then if you go to the northern part of the park, kind of around the northern boundary, Valerie, that's great, the, the um, that is the Alaska range and the Alaska range spans all the way to Denali. So we have this far south kind of eastern part of the Alaska range, which is pretty neat and kind of as, as part of our northern boundary. And then if you go down towards the border with Canada, so that, yeah, great. All the way down towards the border with Canada, there are the St. Elias mountain range. And then finally over towards the west, Western boundary, southwestern, yep, kind of not not as visible on the map as the Chugach Range. So we are we are surrounded by mountains, and they are spectacular. 
you can see our mountains a lot more than you can see Denali. Um, and, and, you know, Denali is an amazing place to go for sure. Um, but the big mountain sometimes is really hard to see. And I, I guided in Denali um, back in the day and people were really, really kind of sad not to, not to get to see it. And it's in clouds a lot. Our mountains are out quite a bit during the summer when people visit. So that is a really important draw for visitors here is just being able to see our mountain ranges. Also, because our park actually borders the ocean, we get a lot of the, the moisture coming off of the Pacific Ocean. And that drops a lot of moisture on our mountains, which create vast glacier systems. And that's another reason to come is that um, being in the presence of a glacier is, is a pretty special thing. And we have uh, the largest concentration of glaciers in North America. Uh, even though it doesn't quite look like it on the map, 25% of our land mass is, is covered in ice. So we have a lot of glaciers, um, especially down towards the southern part of the park. And I would recommend that if you end up flying into Anchorage, um, our glaciers are so large and our mountains are so big that if you sit on the right-hand side of the plane as you go from Seattle to Anchorage, that's one of the best flight seeing opportunities that you get in Wrangell. It's incredible. And I can't tell you how many times I've been on the airplane and been like kind of looking at the people next to me who are reading. And I'm like, you don't understand that's Wrangell St. Elias National Park is right outside your. Window. Uh, see the Malaspina Glacier entire. Um, ice fields that are in our park. So the glaciers are certainly a draw. You can actually walk on a glacier. One of the easier glaciers to access, to, to get to touch, um, is inside our park. And that's in, in Kennecott. And so Valerie, if you can focus on that, the green box, there you go. Yep. So this is the Kennecott and McCarthy are in the heart of our park. And it's a pretty spectacular scenery. So there's the draw there is that there's a town called McCarthy and then alongside the Kennecott Glacier is an abandoned mining town called Kennecott. And when you, you can go for cultural and historical reasons and see the, the mining town, but you're also looking up at the Root Glacier and at the Kennecott Glacier where they come together and then also this bowl of mountains behind it. Really a spectacular location. And in Kennecott, that is one of our main visitor areas, even though it's kind of a challenging to get to, but I'll talk about that in a second. There are preserved buildings from the Kennecott Copper Mine, which was in production from about 1890 until about the 1930s. And then from the 1930s until about the 19, late 1970s, it, it was, you know, it was, a, it was abandoned and falling down. Um, National Park Service was able to acquire the site and we've done extensive renovation to the site. And it is, it's a really cool thing to go and see because a lot of the, the company basically just left. And so, you know, there's a lot of like paperwork and artifacts and things that are just in the town that you can really get a sense of what life was like there in the early 1900s. So that is a really attractive part of the park to get to and to get to know for lots of different reasons, not only spectacular scenery, but also just the historical side and the his history of our park. The other, um, the other draw here can be wildlife. Um, obviously it's a huge park. We have, we have the charismatic mega fauna that a lot of Alaskan places do. Um, of course we have moose and we have black bears and brown bears and um, we have wolverine and caribou. And we are better at, you can have a better chance to see mountains at Wrangell, but you may have a better chance to see wildlife at Denali. So when people ask me like, 
where where should I go see wildlife? I I I typically will point you in the direction of Denali because they do have a core part of the park that that there isn't hunting and they have buses where they that that the wildlife has become acclimated to to those buses and it's it's you don't always see wildlife there but it's a pretty good chance that you're going to we have wildlife we recommend if you want to try to see it um drive somewhere in the early morning or in the late evening um, that you have a better chance of seeing that lynx or experiencing that moose on the side of the road. Um, we also tell people that the best place to see moose is in Anchorage. <laughs> and I know that seems totally weird, but this is an Alaska thing. Like you really do have a good chance of seeing moose in Anchorage because they are used to people and they're along the side of the highway. Um, so you might be able to see them in Wrangell, but keep your eye out if you're coming through Anchorage. Okay, so I've told you all these things. You definitely want to come now. It's totally spectacular. Um, here's the lowdown on like how big is this place? So Valerie, if you can find Copper Center Glen Allen, so it's the intersection of the two highways. You got it. Perfect. Yep. That is probably one of the places where you'll come through and it's a it's a good it's a good connector it, it connects two highways the Glen and the Richardson and so I'll orient you to to our places that you can visit based on times from Glen Allen or Copper Center we do have a main visitor center in Copper Center and that's a great place to to land to talk to a ranger to get oriented to see our park film get your passport stamped um, if you want to visit the northern part of the park, so Valerie, go from go from Glen Allen, and then if you can, yep, follow the Richardson up to Slana. That's where we also have a ranger station, a smaller ranger station there, but you could check in and follow Slana out the Nebesna Road for me. Yep, great. So that's a 20 mile, mostly dirt road um, that we do have our only campground there um, and it's, it's free, but there aren't, there aren't hookups. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a little rustic with vault toilets, but the Nebesna road is an amazing place to see that backside of the Wrangell mountain range, gorgeous views, again, opportunities to see wildlife. It's pretty quiet. Um, it takes, two and a half hours to drive from Copper Center to Slana. And then if you were going to drive the whole road, you'd probably want to, to give yourself another two hours out to the end and two hours back. You definitely want to check with a ranger because the, the road routinely floods. And so you want to be able to make sure that the vehicle you have is going to work for getting where you want to go. And, and they would have road information. The other thing about our roads, and I'll talk about the McCarthy Road next, but they because they are dirt roads, and this is this is where travelers really it's good to get to know this information ahead of time. Most rental car companies aren't really excited about you taking your rental vehicle on a dirt road. Um, I can understand that. <laughs> um, there are some rental companies in Anchorage, and I'm sure in Fairbanks as well that that know that and they capitalize on being able to, you know, having that in your contract that you can take those vehicles on dirt roads. So choose your rental car carefully if that's something that you really want to do. Um, both of our roads, you can take RVs on if it's your own RV and you're feeling kind of adventurous. Um, but large RVs are really not, not a great idea. Um, they're just not built for that. So the Nebesna Road in the north, like I said, two and a half hours to Slana, another two down the road. Um, it's it's close enough that you could base yourself out of Glen Allen and get to out to the Nebesna Road and back in the day. Okay, so Valerie, show uh, again where um, Glen Allen is, and then take the pointer and go down down south. And then towards the on the Edgerton out to Chitna, if you can see where Chitna is, there's a little green box because there's another ranger station there. Yep. So from our visitor center to Chitna, that's on a good highway, um, easy to get to. We have a ranger station there that's historic. 
In Chitna, you can also drive a little bit past it on the McCarthy Road, and you can drive onto the bridge that, that is uh, over the Copper River. And it's kind of hard to see on the map, but the Copper River pretty much defines most of our boundary. And it is, um, it is the home to Copper River Reds, uh, sockeye salmon, very good to eat and shipped all over the world. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty hot fishing destination if you have um, a fishing permit. Um, but you can head to Chitna in a regular rental vehicle and then a little bit beyond Chitna. And, and Valerie, if you can go from Chitna, kind of trace the McCarthy Road out to, to McCarthy for me. Yeah, great. Yep. Perfect. That is about a three hour drive. It's a 60 mile, mostly dirt road. And the slowing is pretty, I mean, the going is pretty slow. And it's very common to have an Alaska adventure of a flat tire in a remote location. <laughs> yep, Valerie's shaking her head. Yep. <laughs> um, I know this because I have staff who live out there. I have, you know, I go out there and a, a flat tire in Alaska is kind of a rite of passage. So see it as an adventure, but also be prepared for it because <laughs> it's common. And then again, that's one of those roads that you're going to have to check with your rental car company. There are shuttles that go from Anchorage to McCarthy. There are shuttles that go from Chitna to McCarthy. So there is an, an opportunity to, if you don't want to take your own car and you don't want to drive the road, there, there are other options for how to get out to McCarthy and Kennecott. You can also fly. So you can fly from Chitna. Um, Chitna is one of the places and there are flight seeing opportunities, which for a park this size, Seeing it by air really does give you the big picture. Um, so consider a flight scene trip if you haven't done that somewhere else or save it for when you come to the Wrangles because it's amazing. Um, but if you fly or you drive or take the shuttle, it'll take you to um, the end of the road. And this is this is where, um, again, being in the know is really helpful because it looks like on the map that you can drive all the way out to Kennecott and, and you can't, um, you get to the end of the road and there's a footbridge and you have to walk across the Kennecott river. And then from there, you can pick up shuttles that will take you the next five miles up to the town of Kennecott or the next mile and a half that'll take you to the town of McCarthy. So just trying to trying to plan in your mind that if you're going to go out there, it's not going to be quick. And so we have people we have people come into the visitor center at 4:45 on a Thursday night, and they're like, "We're driving to Kennecott." <laughs> oh, you can because it's so light out late, but it's it's a four hour drive to the end of the road, and then you still have some distance to get to either McCarthy where there's some art services and a restaurant or up to Kennecott where that's park service land where you have hiking trails and the historic buildings. So know before you go, if your plan is and your heart is set on going out to Kennecott and to McCarthy, make sure you do your research on how to get there. All right, one last thing on the map. Um, Valerie, if you can go back to the Glen Allen intersection. Yeah, and now follow that, follow the Richardson Highway south and keep going all the way past Chitna, turn off to Chitna, keep going south, south, south. Yeah, okay. So this is the other option if you're basing yourself out of, out of Copper Center or Glen Allen, is that road heads to Valdez. And Valdez is a, a port town. Um, it's, it might have heard of Exxon Valdez accident, which actually happened outside of the bay. But um, I talk about Valdez, even though it's outside of the park boundary, because it's a great destination. And if you're going to base yourself out of the Copper Center, uh, Glen Allen area, it's two and a half hour drive to Valdez. And Valdez has hiking trails, it has coastline, it has some amazing um, 
salmon runs um, during late summer, incredible salmon runs where you, I mean, there are so many salmon in the creeks that, um, I mean, they're right there. Like you could literally walk and pick them up. And of course, when salmon are easy to get, the animals know that. And you can go in the evening. And I have I have seen most of my bear sightings in Valdez because they're eating the salmon. Um, there are also stellar sea lions that are that are grabbing salmon and then they toss them around in the air and then they dive back down to get another one and they bark at each other and it's it's just a very um it's a it's a very satisfying place to go and and easy because it's on the highway and the the highway down there is beautiful you go through a gorge and there are waterfalls along the way and then you get out to the coast and it's like oh so um, I just like to add that in. If you're planning your trip, you may want to just include a day to go down to Valdez because it's it's um, it's also a special place. Okay, I'll catch my breath and see if there are any questions. So we have some questions, but I think oh, here's a good one. Um, this one comes from Susan. Um, how long should you expect to allow, I think you said this, that it was about three hours each way from the Chitna point? From Chitna. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, and that's, so then, and it's, it, it's three, it's three comfortable hours. That's driving 35. That's taking some breaks and to use the restroom or walk the Cuscalana bridge. Um, yeah, and we recommend that. Like, take your time. Don't don't drive like crazy out there. <laughs> That's your flat tire <laughs> invitation if you go too fast. Exactly. Um, and so then, yes. just remind me the time from the Glen Allen Copper Center area to Chitna. An hour. Okay, so you're really yeah. looking at four hours each four way. Four hours. If you, wanted, if you mm. wanted to do a day trip. Correct. Not suggesting that you do it, but that would that's what you'd be looking at. Four hours one way. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. Cool. All right. That's all we have for now. So we can move on if you okay. have something else for us. Great. All right. Go to the next slide. All right. So what can you do here? It's a common question that we get when people come into the visitor center. And um, like I said, it is a large wilderness park. So you're gonna need a little more time. It's it's not an easy, quick, kind of like grab your passport, walk into the park and then uh, be out of there. Make sure that you're thinking through your transportation op options, giving yourself enough time to actually get out to the Nebesna Road or get out to the McCarthy Road. Um, so making some, some good effort in terms of preparation is gonna help you. Um, certainly we're available to help as well. Um, like I, like Valerie pointed out on the map, we have visitor centers in Slana, which is in the north part of the park before you go out to that Nebesna Road. Copper Center, which is the main visitor center. Chitna, and that's a good place to stop again for road conditions. And then there is a visitor center in Kennecott. Camping, for sure. So I mentioned the Kendesny Campground on the Nebesna Road. But there are also a lot of informal camping spots. And that's that's one of the really nice things about Alaska, with the exception of our urban areas. Um, it's it's really easy to find a spot that's off the side of the road or a dirt road off the side of the road, kind of keeping in mind, you know, private property. You don't want to be on somebody's front yard. But if you have a van or you have a um, an RV, it's pretty, pretty easy to find scenic lovely spots that you can stay in that are free um, which is awesome um, we also have some state park campgrounds that are that are in the area as well so if you are more comfortable with a campground um, certainly camping is an option here um, backpacking is amazing um, i'm a backpacker um, i've done a lot of backpacking in the lower 48 um, so overnight backpacking, but you could also, there are pack rafting, overnight pack rafting trips or overnight rafting trips. Um, there are fly-in and then base camp trips, um, which are pretty amazing too. 
And when I talk about safety, I'll, I'll prep you for a little more. And I'm wondering if there are people in the audience who that might be of interest to, I can provide you with more information. Um, day hiking is a little more challenging. If you want um, a really, you know, about five mile hike, we don't have very many trails and that that's pretty challenging for people. We have a one mile trail here at the visitor center and copper center. But if you're looking for a more rigorous trail to hike on, you'd need to go out to the Nebesna road or to some of the areas on, on the McCarthy road. And of course, as we talked about, those take a while to get to. So um, again, planning ahead, giving yourself some time to get to those destinations. And if you feel comfortable, there is an infinite amount of non-trail wilderness hiking. And again, you need to be prepared and know what you're doing um, because it is remote, but it, it really is a place where you can park along the side of the road and, and just walk and be kind of feeling like you're, you are pioneering and you are alone with the place. Um, we, we don't get as much visitation as, as some of the, the bigger parks. And so if you're looking for that solitude and, and that experience, this is really a good place for that. And of course, I talked about the, the um, historic experience out in Kennecott, which is also a really neat part of our history. And that is its own kind of experience where you're in this, you know, it's, it's, not a ghost town anymore, but it was for a while and it's been beautifully restored. Lots of great historic exhibits. And there is a, a tour offered by one of our concessions of the of the mill site. And so you can go into this this restored mill that's on the side, it's on, on the side of a mountain, the glacier in front of you, and learn all about how they mined, how they processed copper ore at this mine site. And then you can always go to Valdez too and, and see some ocean and um, some ocean environment and wildlife. So those are the kinds of things that I would recommend that you could do here. Any questions about that? Uh, I think I'd love to know, we didn't get a question about it, but I personally would love to know, you kind of yeah. mentioned that there are some activities that you can do in the park within the winter. So um, you, can you go a little bit into that in case people are curious? Yeah. Um, again, like I, I probably wouldn't, if I was coming from the lower 48 um, and didn't really understand Alaska weather, I wouldn't come between November and February, March, um, because our temperatures can be routinely in January are minus 50, um, minus 40, minus 30, anything below um, really below five, um, you, you need to have a plug-in for your vehicle and a place to plug it in. So if you, if you want to, you don't, you, I wouldn't want you to rent a vehicle in Anchorage and drive out here and then not be able to start the rental car again. But so shoulder seasons, there are some opportunities if you, if you are really well prepared, um, but I would say that none of the services in McCarthy and Kennecott are open past Labor Day. So the McCarthy Kennecott window really is Memorial Day through Labor Day. It doesn't mean that you can't go out there, but it means that if you drove out to the McCarthy Road and you wanted to get to Kennecott, you'd probably be walking. Um, so you'd want to be prepared or you could take your bicycles. Um, you'd need to be prepared to do your own transportation up to Kennecott. And most of the, the mill site tours aren't going to be open. The um, the none of the lodging is going to be open, so you'd be camping. So you just there are opportunities, but you have to be um, very self sufficient. Great, good to know. Yeah, and there's a question about the mother load mine, and that's a good one. Um, you are an informed visitor. Um, the mother load is on the other side of the mountain from where Kennecott is. And it's actually not not a park service site. And as far as I know, it's it it would be very difficult to access. Um, and it's I'm just would gonna be go on private property. Would it be on this side? 
Um, nope. So it's, it's kind of complicated. If you go down to where Kennecott is, mm -hmm. there's a mountain range and then the mountain range that Kennecott's sitting on, like the park service side literally is over here. And then the mother load, it's, it's part of the same vein. So it's part of the same geologic system where there was copper, but it's on the opposite side of the mountain and it's an in holding mm -hmm. within the park boundary. Got it. So it, it may well be open, perhaps uh, not for visitors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I would recommend checking out the, the great hikes from, from Kennecott are the Bonanza mine site and the Jumbo mine. And those are, they're rigorous, but they are amazing, amazing day hikes. And they're great to do from Kennecott. Perfect. Okay, that's all the questions I have for now. Okay, go to the next slide. It's our visitors front desk in Copper Center. And um, where can you go for more information? And certainly I always recommend for any of the national parks, our websites have a lot of information. They have, they have great like background and historic information and information about scientific research and um but also plan your trip it's got the the map it'll have the brochure you can download all of those um, so definitely check out the website if there are anything any closures or things of an emergency nature like we are having a major wildflower fire that would also be on our website so our website's always a good place to check even even like you know before you drive from anchorage just to kind of know um, any COVID closures would also be listed there. Um, so check out the website. All the national parks now have a mobile app, which is amazing. So it's for each of the parks, you can download the app for that park service unit, and then it'll be in your phone and connected to GPS so that you can get information about specific locations where you are at in the park. Um, really handy tool. It's got a lot of information in it. So that's really helpful. And then if you're just trying to find, you know, experience the flavor of, of Wrangell San Elias, check us out on social media. We have Instagram site, we have Facebook, um, we also have Twitter. So that's a fun way to get to know some things that are going on. Come to our visitor centers, of course. Um, our visitor centers are not open in the winter. Um, Pretty much um, May through September is the window for hitting the visitor centers. And then you can always call us. Um, even during the winter, we are open. So our main phone numbers are available just to, you know, I, I love it when people call and they're like, I'm planning my trip. I just need to know the answer. Like, Colleen, what you're asking, how do I get from McCarthy to Kennecott? And it's, thank you for answering that question. It's a super important piece of information. Um, there are private shuttles that run from the end of the bridge up to Kennecott. And I'm not sure which business will have the, the shuttle operation this year, but we're very reliable that you can go to the end of the road. There is paid parking at the end of the road and then walk across the bridge. And alongside the bridge, there will be signs that will cue you to how often the shuttle is going to come, how much they're going to cost. It's pretty easy. But again, the shuttles will only run May Memorial Day through Labor Day. Perfect. And is there anything else you wanted to share to wrap up? And I have one more question that's come in. Okay. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about safety um, because yeah. I am the I'm I'm the park public affairs officer. So I get to do all the news releases when when people have accidents. <laughs> And so it's not my favorite thing to do. I, I want people to come out and have a great time. So I want to just touch on a few things just to be prepared. Um, like I said, uh, we have very few trails. So if you're going to go out into the wilderness, um, make sure you know how to use a GPS unit, that you've downloaded maps ahead of time. Be very cautious with river crossings. Um, Several of our fatalities have been because people underestimate a glacial river. Um, we do have bears. You may not see them, but they're definitely here. Uh, so you can get a bear resistant food container. We loan them out to people for free from our visitor centers. So consider that. Um, an inReach or similar kind of spot device 
is great, especially if you're going to be going in the back country. Um, not all of our locations have, have phone access. Um, you can sometimes get it out in McCarthy and Kennecott if you have the right cover, the right plan um, with the right company. Um, but an inReach is helpful, even if, even for doing long road trips, um, I like to take my inReach with me and to just really be aware that it takes a long time for us to get help to you. It's um, so be prepared with the right clothing for the wet weather with food and, and supplies um, for sometimes folks who get flown out into the back country. If the planes can't get back to you, it may be a couple days before the weather clears again. So having that extra stash of food um, is pretty essential. Definitely recommend bear spray for, for any day hikes. Um, we, our rangers, when they go out on our one mile trail here, they're, they're carrying bear spray <laughs> because um, bears do come through and we don't want any negative, negative interactions. Um, but saying all of that, it's safety is a, an important concern and something to take into consideration, but don't keep those things from um, keeping you from visiting here. It's a spectacular, really special place. It is. I had, I think probably because of the roads and my parents just not wanting to risk their cars. I never, <laughs> I've never visited Wrangell St. Lice. It's still on oh. my Alaska bucket list. And uh, I saw my, I know, I saw my first view of the Wrangell Mountains in 2021 on a tour that was going up the Richardson Highway. And I was blown away because those mountains stand just you can't miss them in there. They're, they're nope. just stunningly beautiful. And then I was absolutely hooked that I need to plan my own trip at some point to make it all the way out the McCarthy road. Um, so I've done a bunch of research, like I'm sure many people watching this have and still always have questions. So um, we've got right. one more question that came in from Colleen and then one more question yeah. that I had in advance okay. and then we can okay. wrap it up. So Colleen just wanted some clarification on the apps. Yeah. So it is the national park service uh, mobile app you go that you can go into that and then you can download an app a, uh, an app for each park so there are specific so you're not downloading this huge 424 <laughs> parks would be too much to download to your phone you would just want to download the app that's specific to the park yeah so you get the, just the data that you need for that park that you're going to be visiting which is perfect exactly yeah okay and then yeah. since we talked about maybe not doing it as a day trip to come out and visit the park what are some of the options for yeah. non-camping accommodation and lodging yeah great so the our chamber of commerce in glen allen is a great place to check out some of the lodging options and some of the the eating options um, there's also um, an organization in McCarthy, Kennecott. That's a private organization that also has some advertisements about um, local lodging. But it's just like it's just like planning a trip in most other places where you can Google hotel or bed breakfast, McCarthy, Alaska, and lots of different options will come up. Same for Copper Center and Glen Allen. Yeah. yeah. So plenty of accommodations um, in the area for sure. The nice thing is there are plenty of accommodations, but not too many. So you won't get overwhelmed trying to choose. But they do, do they ever have times where they sell out? Do you ever have like, we're not like we, maybe holiday weekends yeah. or, okay. Yeah, I would plan ahead. Um, just like for what you're saying, Valerie, is that there aren't that, you know, it's not like at Denali on the, um, at the gateway where there are these huge hotels. Um, it really is more um, individual businesses. So I would plan ahead and, and McCarthy had a pretty busy year last year and they were almost at, I think, 90% occupancy. So planning ahead and getting your reservations is a really good idea. Sorry, I had muted myself. <laughs> Perfect. I try and no, keep okay. myself on mute yeah. so that I don't catch any weird noises or cat meows or anything <laughs> while I'm doing these. Okay. Well, that's all the questions that we had, but I just want to say Yay. thank you again for joining me. This was an amazing opportunity to learn more about the largest national park, the one of the most beautiful national parks. I mean, I don't think you're allowed to choose or is it even possible to consider which ones, <laughs> but I'm, I can choose, I can have favorites and I you am can. very eager yes, to visit can. myself and hopefully we can yeah, cross yeah, paths yeah. in real life when that happens. That'd be fun. Um, and Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if anybody, if you're watching live or you are watching the replay and you have questions, as I said at the top, just head down into the comments and post your questions there and we will get them answered for you, whether I have to tag Carrie back in 
or someone on her team. Right. And um, yep. yeah, we'll, we'll get you care, taken care of so that you feel like you have all the info you need to safely visit and have an amazing time and make me jealous when I see your photos on Instagram. Um, <laughs> if you like this video, please remember to like it here on YouTube. That helps it get served out to other Alaska travelers who want this kind of information. And then if you like this video enough that you want more videos like it, please remember to subscribe to my channel because it is my goal to do videos like this, uh, the seminar series every year. Hopefully we'll have Carrie back next year, someone on her team. And uh, we just want to have that kind of like boost in the algorithm so that all the Alaska travelers out there searching YouTube will find these videos and get the info they need to have a safe and exciting trip to Wrangell St. Elias and the rest of the state. Great. Yay. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much, Carrie. Have a good evening.